How many is good, glad to be in service on a Sunday morning? Let's stand right now, shall we? Let's just lift our hands. Thank the Lord for His touch. Jesus, thank You for Your presence, for Your blessing, for Your strength. God, anoint our minds. God, I pray today to receive the Word and strength. I'm asking You, God, right now in that name that's above every name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are going to be continuing our Bible study from last Sunday, but I'm going to briefly recap what was taught then. But uh, real quickly, if you have your Bibles, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to, for the media people, instead of starting with verse 1 just to save time, I'm going to start, start with... Uh, uh, verse 5, he's talking about the people of God who have an inheritance and who have a hope of the resurrection. And he said, these people, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Amen. And then verse 7, the trial of your faith, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory to the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, and whom though now you see him not, you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith when the salvation of your souls even the salvation of your souls. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, amen, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're talking and continuing uh, in the Bible study from last Sunday, 10 reasons that God entrusts us with trials. Amen. One more time. Lord Jesus, let's go to the Lord. We thank you for your strength. Anoint my lips of clay. Lord, the ears of your people. And let us be able to communicate the word that you have for us. And we give you praise and honor and glory in that name that's above every name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise God. It's certainly an honor to have everyone who is here today. And um, thankful for the word of God that we're about to hear amen not because i'm teaching it but because in fact it is the word of god whoever might be teaching it amen but we're going to recap what we did last weekend but let me just say first of all that how many has ever been in the trial amen we've all been there and um and the bible says that it's not going to be just one trial in our walk with god and then once you make it through that one trial, everything's going to be great from then on until the rapture comes. No, but in Acts 14 and 22, it says this, uh, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in faith that, that we must through what? That many uh, translations say this, through many trials. Through much tribulation, we shall enter the kingdom of God. And so we're not just promised to have a trial or two, and if we get through those, everything's going to be okay. No, he promised us that through, uh, uh, not just that we would have them, but it, they would be the reason that we would make it into the kingdom of God. And it would be through many trials. So what does that mean? Is that like one a week? Or, you know, I've, I've had more than one in one day. I've had phone calls and things happen back to back inside of an hour. And I was in the middle of two or three trials. Suddenly. But some of these happen. And by two days, three days later, they're little trials. You know, they, you get over them and it's fixed, whatever the problem is. But then there's other, others that lasts for weeks or months, and some of them many years. 
Amen? But they're there for a purpose and for a reason. We'll, real quickly, we'll go to the first one. We studied this. I talked for an hour on these first five last week, so i got to hurry up. Trials are part of God's work. Amen? He's the one that does it uh, or allows it. If you're a, ch- a saint of God, he, he will never allow the enemy to bring something against you without giving him permission first. And then some of the trials he sends to you on purpose. And then some of them we bring on, bring on ourselves. But we never catch God by surprise. He never says, oops. Ever. But he is, it's part of God's work. And so it's for his glory. And pain is not without purpose. Psalms 46 and 10 says, Be still, know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. He is God. Amen. And we've, we've, I've heard statements often made where people say, Well, a just God wouldn't allow that to happen. You, you do not define God by your concept of justice. Because God is just. And so if he does it, says it, or allows it, it's just. He is the benchmark that defines justice. This little subculture that we live in in America, uh, as to how we view God through the lens of our, uh, and in this day and hour, our liberal culture, is so far from who and how God works that there's no way we can be accurate in how we describe what happens to people. In what circumstances. To, if God allows it or does it, it's just because God is justice. Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to His purpose. All things are not good. But God will, if you will allow Him, allow those things to be used one way or the other for good in, 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 in his work in your life and if it may take time but it will happen if you'll let him Real, the next one trials put God's power on display amen and when God allows me to step into a trial he may be getting ready to work for his glory so remember if you're in a trial whenever you come out of that trial or whenever you stand strong during the midst of that trial It gives God glory and it proves that His power has the ability and capability to carry you through the trial. And so God's uh, trials put God's power on display. In Judges chapter 7, in verse 2, it says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to, to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel should vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Gideon went out. And he was already had a very inferior force compared to the enemy. And God said, you got too many, way too many. And he took even more away from him than what he already had. So that who might get glory? God. And God uses trials to show that he alone deserves the credit. Amen. Trials make it clear to the world that I am not in control. When you come out of some of these situations, there were people that will look at your lives and say, there's no way that he should have made it through that. And so there has to be something, a supernatural power, a God in heaven that would help them. I think I mentioned a little bit about this before, but I've seen three different times in my life. Well, actually more than that. And Brother Barra, if you'll allow me to use you as an example this morning. I mean, no disrespect in any way. But I remember when Tucson, as he was known, but your son passed away. I went to your house, and you and your family were sitting at the table eating quietly with tears running down your face. I think the funeral was on a Monday, perhaps. There was a church service in between. I can't remember for sure. I believe that's the way it was. But I never expected to see Brother and Sister Barrett at church that day. They they deserve to be off. And look, if you have a a loss and you're not able to be at church, don't think we're judging you in any way because if there ever was a legitimate reason to be with your family and to grieve and, and, and not 
need to face a crowd at that moment, that's, t- that's fine. But however, that Sunday morning, I'll never for- forget seeing you walk in, Brother Barry, and your wife, knowing the loss and what you had to face. Because there was something about coming to church and being faithful that meant something to you. And it was a testimony to me that only through the Holy Ghost, only through God's power, amen, can you do something like that. And whenever they did that, I I thought that day, this day, God has received glory. Because of a trial that He has put upon one of His saints of the Most High God. Talking about being faithful even in times when times are bad. Amen. Three other times I've watched parents uh, stand before the casket of their children. It should never be that we bury our children before we do. And lift up their hands and give God praise in the face of everything that was going on. Only through that can God get glory in a trial. And sometimes that's what happens through trials. I feel the Holy Ghost. Anybody feel what I'm feeling up here? Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and thank God for the faithfulness of people. Hallelujah. Come on, some of you are going through trials right now. And the devil and the enemy is trying to to, to tell you it's just no use anymore. Why don't you just give up and throw in the towel? But I want to encourage somebody today that that is not the answer. But if you'll just keep coming to church and keep being faithful, I promise you at some point down the road, you're going to come out of this trial and God is going to get the glory. Praise God. Amen. i got to hurry up. This may turn into a three-part series. Trials prepare me for service. You know what gets us ready for big trials? Little trials. And he said, you know, if you're faithful over a few, over the smaller, I will make you. And I know it was a prophecy in some point in context about the, uh, the, the, the future, but nevertheless, it, 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 it's, it's the same principle right now in the present, and that is... The little things, that being faithful in the small things is what prepares you to be uh, great, great in the kingdom for greater things. And when David uh, shepherded those little sheep, you know, on the backside of the hill, when nobody was watching, he faithfully done his task, he wrote his psalms, he prayed, he comforted those. And, and, and the Bible says that when he came to bring the food to his Brethren in the, in the field, that, it, that they said it was but just a few sheep. They told him, and said, go back to your heel and it's just a few sheep. What's going on with those, that little group that you're supposed to be watching out for? I believe it was Brother Tristan preaching Friday night made the statement. Uh, something to the effect that they said, you know, you're, we know why you're here. You just want to get seen and, and see what's happening. You, you got too much pride. You think you can deliver it. You, know, you need to go back and do your... You're look, what what you as it was as if, as if it was some insignificant thing, but I tell you, who was watching it and did not feel like it was insignificant, it was God. And He said, "The heart of that little guy right there, when nobody's watching, is the heart that I need to lead Israel." Samuel asked Jesse, "Where is there any more kids?" Any more sons? Oh, yeah, there's one more. He's just a, you know, my youngest, he's back and taking care of the sheep. Not much to look at, that guy. Samuel said, bring him. Maybe he is, and it was confirmed. And God prepared David through little trials and little things. The bear, of course, you know, (laughs) we can call the bear and the, the lion, a little trial, but I'm not sure that was a very little one. I recently observed a video on the trail camera of a, of a uh, mountain lion 
catching about a 10-point buck and uh, a live footage of the actual attack and what happened afterwards. And I want to tell you, friend, it was a violent encounter. Very violent encounter. It made me second-guess myself on my little thoughts of protection that I have when I wade off in the woods, my little pistol or my little fixed-blade knife. That deer is far more aware of his surroundings than I'll ever be. He never saw that cat coming. He was a big animal. And if you ever tried to corral a deer, uh, you know that it's not easy. You just go ahead and grab a hold of one of them, see what happens. This cat didn't have any trouble. They fought violently all down the hill, but he emerged victorious. And I thought, what chance am I going to have? Recently, I read an article about a man in, I believe it was in Colorado, who was attacked by a mountain lion and choked that mountain lion to death with his bare hands. I said, buddy, somebody needs to get a hold of this guy. This was like David of old. You know, I mean, this man here, he needs to, he's, he's, he's tougher than Chuck Norris. He, he could give Chuck Norris some lessons, man. And, and, and so, but, but David, all these little things that God prepared him for. Of course, when a time came, he stepped up, he made mistakes, and he, had, he even went through greater trials, but God prepared him. If you want to be God to entrust you with more, be faithful with little. That includes everything. Money, responsibility, jobs, hey amen, leadership. Romans 5 and 3 says, But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that the tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It, it, that's kind of a little bit of a, 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 a synopsis of what it means when you mature in God. Start out with tribulations, <laughs> and it grows you. Number four, trials sanctify me. The process of sanctification is the continuing work of the Holy Ghost. Making you better and better and perfecting you and working on those little things that, that need to be worked on and, and, and maturing. Amen? I don't handle trials. I don't always handle trials well. Anybody else identify with that? And I think one of the reasons God called me to the ministry was to teach me how impatient I really am. And so today, I have a word for Brother Davis. You shouldn't have prayed for patience, brother. Because now you're going to really realize what patience means. But when things don't go as planned, I realize how impatient I am. Amen? The trials don't cause me to sin by being impatient angry or complaining but they simply reveal what's inside trials reveal what's already there and says this is something you need to work on amen and so thank god that that trials amen continue to help god sanctify me and he said in james 1 and 2 my brethren count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations what count it all joy when you fall in that diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. I better not, I better not comment on that. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Amen. Trials make me depend on God. We're like the church of Laodicea here in North America. We have need of nothing. If I have a financial need, I figure out a way to get the money. You don't have to have credit. 
Now, you might pay 52% interest, but if you want $100 or $500, you can get it. These advertisements that'll pop up or whatever, and they'll say, Need a vacation? $5,000. All it takes is a matter of 10 minutes. Sign on the dotted line. But even those that don't live that way, that work hard, that make a good living, that provide for their family, that drive cars and nice homes, eat out. What do I need God for? What's He going to do? I've got it all under control. I don't have any addictions. I don't have any vices. I'm self-sufficient. And it's easy not to depend on God. And we hear a lot of miracles from third world countries because they have nowhere else to go but God. We have everywhere else to go but God. And so we have to consciously decide, hey, no matter how sufficient I think I am, we cannot do this without God. We cannot make it. It's not just about this temporal world because that is, all of that is wood, hay, and stubble. But you will not make it into eternity and you will not make it in right standing before God without God. We have to depend on Him. Amen? And trials are God's tool to make or to break my dependence on self so that I will trust Him alone. So you got it all figured out, huh? You're self-sufficient, right? Man, you got all your bills paid. Nobody's calling you. You know what that reminds me of? God sitting up there talking to whoever he talks to. And says, look down there at Darwin Burks. You know who he's starting to remind me of? Somebody else in Scripture. By the name of Job. Now, I'm not trying to compare myself to Job because I'm, I'll never be half the man he was. But Job had it all. Self-sufficient. Had a work, a relationship with God. The Bible said there was none beside him in all the earth. There was no complaint. There was no sin. The first question we do when we go through a trial is start asking why. And thank you, Lord, for saying, Hey, Lucifer, have you considered my servant Job? He would be a great one to just throw a big trial on. He was self-sufficient. He was great among his people. He had many possessions. He, there was nothing. But the Lord said, I want him to grow a little bit. I want him to realize, and even though he does, he doesn't know me like he thinks he does. I, I, and so therefore, he's about to go through a trial. And, and, and trials and weaknesses, folks, keep me from embezzling God's glory. There's times when I cause things to happen. And I think within myself, boy, look what I did. Look at the church I have built. Look at, the, look at that message I preached. Look at, look at how, man, look at me. Would you look at that? And God said, hey, Bubba, you do remember, right? You didn't do that by yourself. You forgot about that part? So I'm going to give you a trial. I'm going to show you that it still takes me. You can't. You forgot. I'm in, I, and, and, and whenever we accomplish anything, this is how we have to do it. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. For everything. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 28, In base things of the Lord, or of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and thing which, things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. I'll, make, I'll, 
to accomplish this in a way that you never dreamed. Just so I can make sure that you or somebody else besides me doesn't get the glory. I'll make a donkey talk. The rocks will cry out. I, whatever I need to do. Now I've been teaching 27 minutes. And I'm just now back to where we're supposed to start today. So let's hurry. Trials show others that God is dependable. As I go through trials, Brother Larry, others are watching. They are watching to see how I respond. If I respond in faith. If I respond having peace in the midst of comfort. That's normal, right? Everything's good and you got, it's a peace, peace is abounding in your home. and all. That's normal. But having peace in the midst of a trial is not normal for humanity. And so trials give me an opportunity uh, to speak out about this hope that I have in God. If I complain or if I have a bad attitude when facing these trials, I forfeit my opportunity to speak of the greatness of God. Remember you know that song. God has been good to me. So very good to me. And I better stop because I'm going to kill this whole message. With my voice. But if you read the words to that song. Whether I, I'm in found or whether I'm lost. Whether I'm in sadness or whether I'm in happiness. Whether I'm rich or poor, it does not matter. God has been good to me. He, he is dependable. He does not owe me another thing. I want to tell you something, folks. We're sitting here by the grace and the mercy of God. The fact that we woke up this morning with breath in our bodies... Amen. Is evidence that we give God glory. Amen. And that He is a dependable and a faithful God. He's sovereign. And God entrusts us with trials so that we can be a light and a witness. So let's not waste these opportunities. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, He said this, But and if... Ye suffer for righteousness' sake. Happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. I know I've been through a lot. But God's been good to me. Of all the bad things that I've faced, there's been many more good that outweigh the bad in my walk with God. And besides that, what about all the things that God prevented you from going through? What about all the times when He preserved you when you didn't even know about it or weren't even aware of it? Because the Bible said that He would keep us unto that day. Of His glorious appearing. Thank God that whenever we have a trial and we stay faithful, that God is a dependable God. Amen. Next, trials show us and others that God is infinitely valuable. As I go through trials or loss with peace and with joy and with faithfulness, others are watching. And they are watching to see if I respond in joy. And when I, when I have joy in the midst of loss, it shows the world that living for God and being with Jesus is better. Unfortunately, joy in the midst of loss is not my default setting. 
What is your default setting? I, I, I think my default is complaining, self-pitying, seeking sympathy. And you've heard me say this so many times. But often we react on our emotion without thinking. And uh, I don't even remember what it was, which is, which, which is good. That means we got something going right because in a, in a, in a relationship um, uh, between a husband and a wife, you have to learn to forgive quickly and forget often. So this happened like yesterday or the day before, and I cannot right now recall even what it was. But I know what the scenario was. Something was, was mentioned or something was said, and I just jumped. And it was actually a little deeper than that, but it was in anger or kind of frustrated. I just reacted, you know, like. And uh, my, my wife responded, probably. Hers probably was thought out a little better or whatever, but because after she said what she did, and then I, a little bit later I thought about what I said and everything, I said, why in the world? Why? Why did I do that? Why didn't, why didn't I just think about that for a second? And then... Respond in, in, a, in a good way. Because I'm going to tell you something. The longer we're together and the older I get, the less I like being on the bad side. I want everything to be good between me and uh, Mama. Amen? Praise God. And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to change my nature, but my default setting in a, in a trial is more like complaining and self-pity and seeking sympathy. Amen. But, but, but what is your default setting when it comes to responding to trials? I must learn that Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer. Amen. And God teaches through trials and loss that He alone is my treasure and my great reward. Amen. He is invaluable. This doesn't mean that I laugh it off. I mean, loss hurts a lot. These trials hurt. But my joy is not in my circumstance. But it is in something that cannot be shaken. Amen. We can feel incredible loss and, and yet have an unshakable joy in God at, at the same time. He is the peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. He is the joy in the midst of sadness. He is the object of my worship when I don't have personally anything to worship about. I don't worship because of my circumstance, but I worship Him because of who He is. And He is an infinitely invaluable God unto me. So even if we lose everything, God is still enough. And through tears we can say with Job in chapter 1 verse 21, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm paraphrasing, and you've heard me mention it probably before. But later on, whenever he was past the trial, and God had restored everything and more of what he had lost... He said this in so many words. Lord, I once spoke about you with my mouth. But now I see you. The purpose of Job's trial was simply to cause him to grow. 
It was not a judgment. He had done nothing wrong. It was simply that God knew there was a greater relationship and a greater walk with God that he could ever have without that trial. You say, Brother Burks, I want to be used of God. I want to grow in the Lord. I, I want to be in leadership. I want to make a difference in the kingdom. Well, I want to tell you something. That's a prayer that you should pray. But you better get ready for it. Part of the way that God prepares you for your desire is to put you through trials. Men who have a heavy anointing on their ministry. If you look in their history, there's often a terrible trial that they Showed themselves faithful through. That's how God does it. Psalm 73 and 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Come on, he's infinitely valuable. Who, who else do I have, Lord, but you? And there's none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh... And my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart. And my portion forever. David. In Habakkuk chapter 3 and 17. It says although the fig tree shall not blossom. Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. And the field shall yield no meat. The flock. Shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Now, what he was doing in that day and hour was painting a very, very bleak picture. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places. Amen. Amen. To the chief singer on my stringed instrument. He wrote this and began to sing. Lord, I'm going to go and find myself in situations where family shall fail me. There won't be any money in the bank and no food in the cupboards. I'll be wearing things that were hand-me-downs and I'll be struggling with everything I've got. But yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation because He is the one that really matters. I wonder what John thought after a lifetime of service. When the purging of Israel and purging of areas in Asia Minor of the Jews caused him to be exiled to Patmos. He was basically given the care of Mary, the mother of Jesus. He lived at Corinth on a mountain overlooking the city. And he was basically the, the, the patriarch of the New Testament church at that point in his life. But what about his servant, Procurus? He's mentioned as one of the deacons in Acts. He was not exiled. But he chose to go with John anyway. And it's believed in all manners that when John was receiving, receiving his revelation, it didn't just happen in an hour or two. It was over a period of a long period of time when God would visit and give him visions and that he would dictate and Procurus was actually the one by his own hand that wrote down Revelation. He was put on the side of Patmos which was reserved for political prisoners and those of those nature. They didn't put them behind bars, but they were to fend for themselves. They did not have anything to eat. They had to just find whatever they could. They lived in whatever they could fashion. Most people believed that he lived in a cave for 18 months. But when he went there, and when Procris chose to go with him, 
He went there with the right spirit and the right attitude and said, oh, this is a trial, all right. But somehow God's going to get glory out of it. So every morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to pray. Every morning I'm going to pray for the church in Asia Minor and Pergamos and Galatia and all those churches. I'm going to continue to be faithful and to trust my God because I will not deny Him. I'm not going to be involved in emperor worship or paganism. And so therefore, I will serve out my sentence. But I'm going to be faithful even in this trial. And because of his faithfulness, God said, I'm going to give you something. And I'm going to tell you of things to come and even things present that nobody would even understand. And they they will see it come to pass in the future. And I'm giving it to you. And it's going to be included. He didn't probably know it at the time. In the canon of Scripture. What a great reward for a man in the midst of a trial. God's got to receive the glory, folks. We need to understand that when we're in a trial, recognize It's God's working on us. Amen? Number eight. I got 18 minutes. Y'all with me? Trials are an opportunity for reward. God entrusts me with trials as a gift. If I respond to the trials and faith and holiness and The right way I can have joy in the fact that I am storing up rewards in heaven. You go read Hebrews 11, the latter part. And you see the things that God mentions. Especially. And the thing that is going to bring reward in heaven is going through trials. You're going to be honored for the things that you did. I don't know. There might be a mention. When I get there, I don't know. He, he was a good pastor. He built a beautiful church there in Jasper. They might say that. He might not even mention that. But what he might say is, he went through the darkest trial that he ever been through. Things that people did not even know about. But yet he stayed faithful. And he did not turn his back on me in the time of trouble. And so therefore, hey man, I'm going to give him a reward in heaven. Brother Kelly, he might say to you, he started praise singing. And buddy, it was amazing at the talent. And he's doing a great job. But I want you to know he's saying people right into the altars. I don't know. They might say that. And I hope they do, Brother Kelly. But more than likely, they're going to say he was put through trials. Many things that other people would not even understand. But yet he kept coming to church and he was faithful in the sight of God. Therefore, I have a reward. Mm. I may have to preach that later. God's going to give us reward one day, folks. But God entrusts me with these gifts as a reward. And if I try to respond to the trials and with fear or complaining, I might miss the opportunity for a reward. He said it in Peter 1 and 6, wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, as we read earlier, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I want my life somehow To be a worship and to be a praise unto God. And if he's got a reward up there, whatever it is, Lord, I want to obtain that reward. Paul said we press toward the mark. The high calling of God. We fight not as one that beateth against the air. But we press toward the mark. Amen. This is not in vain, folks. Number nine, trials may be 
spiritual warfare. And you've heard me say that we got to recognize what's happening to us. Sometimes it's spiritual warfare. I want to tell you that not every time, though. <laughs> I woke up this morning, the devil got a hold of me and then took the first step, and I stepped on a toy horse. When I leaped off of that, I tripped and hit my head on the closet door. The devil has been fighting me today. It's going to be a spiritual war. Listen, everything's not spiritual warfare. Sometimes, you know, we get to testifying. The devil's fighting me, bless his holy name. But then there are times when we think it's nothing but just marital pro or my kids acting up or somebody did something at work and we think it's just the run of the day. But it's really, if the, Lord, if the enemy didn't cause it to happen, he's taking it and capitalizing on it and it becomes a spiritual attack. And they don't often just happen one day and then they're over the next day. Usually a spiritual attack is a bit of a prolonged occurrence. Most of the time. And it's something that you'll face for a little while. Two and a half years ago, we, just after starting this new building that we were sitting in this morning, everything in the world seemed to start coming against me personally. Now, I've been around this my entire life. I've been involved in building programs and remodeling. I've observed pastors and their fight during the midst of this. And just because you know what can happen, just because you saw other people go through something, does not necessarily mean you're prepared to go through it yourself. And I know the struggles. And I've had elders, ministry even in this own, this very church that's that's went through building programs and pastored churches and talked directly to me and prepared me and warned me and tried to strengthen me. And I'm like, yes, sir, I understand all that. I've got it figured out. I understand it. I know exactly what you're talking about. But I want to tell you, uh, from a spiritual warfare perspective, I did not understand what I was talking about. I didn't realize what was happening at first. Even though I'm very aware of how the enemy works, like I said, when it's happening to you, it's hard to recognize from the inside looking out. And I'm a little slow or stubborn. And it took a couple of elders and trusted mentors to point out what I was facing, spiritual warfare. And, okay, I'm facing spiritual warfare. That's awesome. Now what? I know I'm facing it, but what am I supposed to do about it? I want to tell you one thing you do. This is, this is, this is so profound. It's, it's, nobody's ever probably even thought of this. Stay faithful. Am I supposed, do I drop the mic now? When you don't know what to do, don't do anything. When you're on an emotional high, don't make any major decisions, please. When you're on an emotional low, whatever you do, don't make any major decisions, please. Because most of the time, they're not going to be the right ones. Because they're emotionally driven. They're not logically thought out. They're not spiritually guided. They're not, they, they, a lot of times we do it rashly and quickly without seeking counsel. For some reason, we Westerners are often slow to consider 
spiritual warfare, at least I was. When you begin to do the work of God and become involved in facilitating the carrying of the gospel into the dark places of this world, when you reach out for the hopeless and begin to provide a vehicle for deliverance, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm describing what we're doing here at New Life Church. When you begin to enter Satan's strongholds, I want to tell you, not just the pastor, but you too as individuals, he's not going to go down without a fight. When I think of Brother, Brother Daniel, I don't know if what happened to you last Monday night, before last or whenever it was a week or so ago, I'm not saying that was a spiritual attack because there probably is some kind of physical thing that whatever they're going to figure out what's going on here. But I will say this, the enemy would love to capitalize on something like that to stop what you are doing in Hardin County Jail. To end what was begun with these guys sitting over here. And, 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 and see, that night, what a lot of us may not realize, it was baptismal night in the prison or the jail. Brother Daniel, is it 12-week course? He teaches a 12-week course. How many of you have completed now at this point, Brother Daniel? Yeah. Two or three, year, two or three years' work of work that he's been doing there. They've, I guess, basically pretty much turned that arm of the prison ministry over to Brother Daniel and his wife and those that help him over there. And... Every 12 weeks or so, depending on when, how many weeks are in between or whatever, they complete a course that's, that's teaching these people the truth and the gospel. And at the beginning, somewhere in the beginning, they teach on Jesus' name baptism, and he taught it. And there was only two signed up. So, when it came for the baptismal service some weeks later, I don't know how many exactly, this past Monday, I, I think Sister Hill, who is also involved, her and her husband in the prison ministry as well, she went and gave a testimony or taught or did something. I'm not exactly sure, but she was there as well that night. But somewhere in that point, either the, the, the time before, maybe even that night, Brother Daniel was concerned that there was only two people that had signed up. And so he decided to reteach Jesus' name baptism. And he hunkered down and he taught it more in depth than probably had ever taught before. And there were six more people signed up. And so that Monday night, after they were done ministering, they baptized eight people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins according to Acts chapter 2. And six of those eight received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Speaking in another tongue. When you start doing what he's doing, I'm telling you, Brother Daniel, and others that are involved, there's going to be trials that come against you and things that come against you that are a spiritual attack. It was only an hour or so later when he had a, the seizures and what happened. At the restaurant, I'm thankful they were not in the vehicle. With him driving. But whether it was brought on by the enemy, which is doubtful, or whether the enemy just would use it to capitalize, he does not like what's happening and he wants to disrupt it. There's so many ministries happening in this church. Whenever you do that, he's not going down without a fight. But I don't not. I do not need to fear spiritual warfare because Satan is like a dog on God's leash. He can only do what God allows. And God may allow Satan to do things to me that I would not desire. But it cannot change. It's not going to change my trust in Him. And when trials come, I must keep my eyes on God. And I need to be aware of Satan's tactics. 
And he said to the Corinthian church, Paul wrote in 2 and verse 11, Let let Satan should take an advantage or get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's what we're doing here right now. We're highlighting the fact that, that Satan uses these devices to disrupt the kingdom. But when we're not ignorant of them, we can take dominion over him. And say, yes, there's a tr- this is a trial, but it's one that I'm in the middle of spiritual warfare. And I already know who won the battle, and I already know who wins the war. Satan, get thee behind me. In the name of Jesus, I take dominion over the spirits that would come against me in our church and our ministries. But he wants us to discourage us and that we'll give up. He will attack our health, our family's health. Send a myriad of trials to take us out of the fight. Don't let him. Keep your eyes on God. And if you're getting bombarded with trials, take heart. It may be because Satan is not happy with your life and your ministry. That is the goal. I believe it was Sister Grace Peters standing behind this pulpit said, My plan is to continue disappointing the devil. She said it a little better than that, I think, but that was the gist of it. When he's upset at you, take heart because you're doing something right. When he's fighting you and you realize you're in spiritual warfare, rejoice because you're doing something right. And the Bible says in Acts that the disciples rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. They were beaten. They were imprisoned, and when they were released, they were told never to preach the name of God, Jesus, again. And when they got to the home uh, where everybody was waiting on, they said, Hey, we were just beaten. We were just put in prison and told us not to preach the gospel. Praise God. We're doing something right. We're rejoicing that we're counted worthy to suffer. Lord, I want to, Brother Burks, I want to be like Jesus. I want to learn what it's like. Well, you better get ready because the only time you can be like Him is when you identify with Him in His sufferings. He was rejected by His own countrymen. He was rejected as the Messiah and as the King. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was crucified. His closest friends and family turned their back on Him and lied about Him. Welcome To being like Jesus. And some of us show up in church and say, Brother Dalton didn't shake my hand. Boy, you're in a trial. You are in a major trial. Give God glory that you were counted worthy to suffer because Brother Dalton didn't shake your hand. My point is, where are we really at? We're going to stand in judgment beside these people. Amen? It's 11 o'clock, but can you give me about three more minutes? We got, this next service is going to be a little unique today anyway. And so, um, I, I think I can take a little bit, three to five minutes here, Liberty you don't mind Psalms 27 and 14 says wait on the Lord be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart wait I say on the Lord Mm. John 4 and 4 you are of God, children, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That word wait, kevoa, it's a Hebrew word that means to, it really, uh, literally it means to hope, hope in the Lord. You know, when you're waiting on something, the, the, the thing that helps you to wait on it is the hope of getting it. And you say, man, when I order something to do with hunting or something, you know, on Amazon, 
I just can't hardly wait for it to get there. And I'm hoping, I'm like, boy, this is Amazon. I hope it's on Prime because it's going to get here tomorrow. I am not a layaway guy. I hate layaways. Because you have to wait. <laughs> and you have to just keep hoping. But figuratively, that word kevoi, the, the connotation behind it is to weave a cord together. Go look it up. And a beautiful example of it is when it says, even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word strength is intr intrinsically tied in that verse to waiting. You want to be get stronger in God? Be willing to wait when you're in the middle of a trial. Be willing to wait on Him when He hasn't answered your prayers. Be willing to wait on Him when your dreams have not been fulfilled, but you're still there. And the longer you wait, the more you weave that cord. And it's the, 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 the idea behind it, if you want to commentate on the verse, is that waiting ties you to God and it's from Him that you get your strength. The tying part mean, meaning the weaving of the cord together. The Bible says the threefold cord is not easily broken. You don't, you don't want to be tied to God with a four pound monofilament single strand line. You want some spider wire. Or something that's braided, right? If I'm frog fishing... I don't want no. I want, I want a braid because he's going to hit it in the middle of the lily pads. He's going to go straight down in the grass. And I'm not, not only am I going to be catching a 12-pound bass, but I'm going to be dragging another 40 pounds of vegetation with it. So, i got to have something that won't break. In your trial, you will wait... You will find yourself waiting and saying, God, when is this going to be over? But every time you walk through that door and go to that prayer room, they add another thread to the cord. Hallelujah. Every time you walk down here and pray for somebody else, when you don't feel like praying for your own self, much less somebody else, you add another thread to the cord. And God said, I'm going to give you strength. And when you come out of this trial, you're going to be stronger than you ever were before. And I'm going to be tied to you like a woven cord that cannot be broken. Amen. Wait on the Lord. And be of good courage. And you shall, He shall strengthen your heart. Hmm. Ah, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. You will defeat the enemy. Finally, i got to hurry. I'm done with this last point. Trials may be for discipline. Start with the heart. Even though this is listed last, I always start with examining my heart. If I'm in a trial, I think, why am I in this? Did I bring this on myself? Did I, is God trying to tell me that I need to make some changes? He uses trials and sickness and various things to get our attention and to reveal our sin, not to the public, to us. As a loving Father, He wants to restore us to fellowship with Him. He talks about the ministry of reconciliation in Scripture. But we better practice it in our daily lives. And as a father, my children are still young, pretty young. 
There's disciplining that has to happen. While I am friends with my kids, while I love them, I'm not their best bud. I might be able to be that close at one point in some time in the future, but we can't raise our kids like best buddies. Because they won't respect us enough to receive the discipline that it takes to cause them to grow and become men and women. But when I do have to discipline, you know what I want to put into action? The ministry of reconciliation. Because they've done something to create an issue between them and daddy. And daddy says, you're not going to do that because that's not right. And so therefore, whatever discipline we figure out, it happens. But we do it in the idea for them to recognize their wrong out of love and then to be reconciled back into beauty and harmony. But I want to tell you, when God's discipline and when you've done something to, to bring on His discipline, there is a little bit of separation going on. Whether you want to admit it or not. And I don't like being disciplined. Nobody does, right? But in Hebrews 12, at verse 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. That's, that's correction. For faint nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Hey Amen. Sometimes the Lord uses His Word to rebuke us. Anybody ever been rebuked? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that one uh, voicemail I heard on the phone. He said, uh, I'm not here to answer your call. If you uh, would like to uh, leave a message and at the beep, but if you're a bill collector, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> That's not the kind of rebuking I'm talking about. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. That's you know what that means? Whipping, beating. <laughs> My poor kids. I I don't, we can't call it that now, it seems like. But, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. It's this chastening, it's, it, the reason we even feel in it, it don't feel good to the flesh, but it's because of the love of God. Psalms 139, 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. That's a prayer we ought to pray on a daily basis. Search me, God. If there's anything that shouldn't be there, remove it. Cast it in the sea of forgiveness. Take away this, this, this you know, uh, corrupt man, this fallible being, this human that doesn't have any strength. Remove it. So God entrusts us with trials. Often it's for discipline. Often it's for him to receive glory. Often it's to prove his faithfulness. It's to sanctify. We could go on. But God is truly God. And the storms and the trials of life may rage. But I want to tell you that when you look at it, perspectives can change, change everything. Keep your eyes on God in the midst of the trials. There's things that he's using those trials to accomplish in your life. And if you will trust him... He is at work in us, through us, and around us. So take courage. He is working. Amen? Let's stand.